What a terrible abomination to play One Direction in church. I'm sorry, but I thought you should see that um, just so you know the truth of how they actually sound. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But this song is called The Story of Their Life. And um, I just saw that video. I had to show it. And so I was looking in the lyrics, The Story of My Life. That's a great song title. Surely they've got some good lyrics in there. I can tie in with the message. Nah, there's nothing. There's no good lyrics in the whole song. It's all rubbish about the story of their life, what they're known for in their life. The whole mission for their life is um, they chase this girl and she lets her down. So what do they do? They try and find a better girl, a hotter girl, a a different orientation girl, whatever. Um, The story of their life is just wasted in a uh, trivial pursuit that leaves them high and dry, leaves them with nothing. But that's not the story of our life, amen? Amen. Well, that shouldn't be the story of our life. We are called to a greater story than that. But I want to ask us that question. I want us to start thinking about what is the story of your life? What would people that know you, what would they say is your story? Um, What would God say right now your story is? And um, how do we write our story? What is it that we use to, what are the ingredients we use to make up our story? What will be known for in our life? Let me read a quote from John F. Kennedy. It says this, Efforts and courage are not enough without purpose and direction. Having a cause and a purpose and a mission, amen? That is what writes the story of your life. That's what sets you on the path. Last week, Pastor Eugene preached on the power of a dream. An awesome message to start us off was our Vision Sunday. And he talked about the power of a dream, how it pushes us in the direction that God's called us to go. And he also preached about the three core pillars of our church, what we're going to build our church on this year. He preached, do you guys remember that? Three C's. It was uh, cause, community, and corporation, how they're both three integral parts of this church. And today, I want us to look at the cause the mission, what is, what is our reason for being here? I mean, why does this massive big building exist filled with you know, nearly 200 people? What is our cause as a church? And um, because the church is not just this building, and we all know that, but you are the church. You are the church. So really what I'm asking is what is your cause? Because what your mission and your cause is, is what this church is all about. So it's not about, you know, what Pastor Eugene preaches on Sunday. It's about What are you doing and living? What is your cause? Because that is what the real cause of our church is. Another cool quote from Frederick Nietzsche is, he says, um, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how, can bear almost anything. If they've got a why, a reason for living. So I've got three questions. What is the cause or the mission that should drive our church? And then what is the cause that should drive you? And the last question is this, what is the cause that did drive Jesus? What was it that motivated Jesus? Because if we uncover what fueled Jesus in his life, if we find out what his motivation was, then it'll unlock for us the key to following in his footsteps. He lived his life intentionally, amen? He lived his life on purpose. He lived the most incredible life anyone's ever lived. There's been no human being since the creation of the world who has left an impact on the globe like Jesus did. And in 33 years, like that's crazy. 33 years completely turned the whole humanity around. So um, let's find his passion, amen? Let's find his purpose, his mission, his cause. What was it that drove him? Because Jesus lived with a mission that drove him to endure the greatest obstacles and to overcome them. So in Luke chapter 4, it's one of my favourite verses um, that we're going to read soon. In Luke chapter 4, we're going to read a scripture from Jesus where he actually declares, he says, this is my mission. This is what I came here to do. This is why I came down from heaven and came to earth. This is my mission. And um, in Luke chapter 4, just to give you a little bit of context, Jesus has only just begun his ministry. It's at the beginning of his ministry. He's just gone down to John the Baptist and he's been baptized. And when he came up, the Spirit of God came down on him and anointed him and it looked like a dove. And then heaven opened up and God said, this is my kid. I love this kid. He's my son and I'm well pleased with him. And then straight after that, God led him to go into the wilderness, into a desert. And he was tempted and trialed for 40 days and had all kinds of temptations and trials. And after overcoming that, the Bible says... He returned to Galilee, his hometown, in the power of the Spirit. 
So he goes back to his home and he finds the church service of their day, the synagogue service in the Sabbath day. And um, people are hearing about this guy called Jesus. And so he's, they know about him because he grew up there and they've started to hear some big things that he's doing, big things around the place. Anyway, so they invite him to speak. So he finds the scroll from Isaiah and he reads out this verse. We're reading from Luke 4, 18, 19. If we can put that slide up, that'd be great. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Amen? Amen. Oh, come on. That that was worth a better amen than that. Amen? Amen. That is an exciting passage of Scripture right there. And we keep going, verse 20. Um, Then he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. I love this. It's like a bit of a dramatic look into the church. So imagine he's in that synagogue. He stands up and he reads that scroll and he just reads that one little passage and then he just sits there. And it says, the eyes of everyone were fastened on him. So he was just sitting there looking at him, waiting for a dramatic... Um, dramatic awkward silence and then he began by saying this today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing isn't that cool so that is that was written hundreds of years ago that scripture from Isaiah but Jesus said I have come because the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor Man, I'm excited. This, this is so exciting. And I just love it that God's speaking this through what Neil said, the mission of our church. We are reaching out and um, touching people all around the globe. And what Pastor Barry said was well about the mercy and the love of God, the mission that Jesus had. It's just so cool. So what did Jesus come, that mighty man of God? What drove him to proclaim the good news? Isn't that cool? To proclaim freedom. For the oppressed, recovery of sight for the blind, and to set the oppressed free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That was his mission and his cause. God came down into flesh as Jesus. God himself made himself Jesus and took on this prophecy as his mission on earth. And it's incredible. Like, he did something that no one else can ever do. And in a way, He was completely unique. None of us can become a Messiah in our own right and die for the atonement of our friends and stuff. That's just ridiculous. But God calls us to follow in his footsteps still. He said, he set the example for us. He said, I've done this. Now follow me. Do what I do. Live like I live. Follow my example. He says, the Father sent me. Now I'm sending you to copy what I've done. So what are we meant to do with the mission of God? So the reason I asked those three questions and then asked about what was Jesus' mission, because I believe we should be joining with the mission of what God is doing. Amen? Because God's been at work since creation of the world. Amen? You know, he's been, he knows what he's doing. He's on a track. He's got a mission. And he is at work in this world right now since the beginning of before Jesus even came to earth. He was at work and he has been working all through that time. So let's connect with him. Amen? Let's connect with his mission and take it as our own. Let's join the mission of God and um, leave our own ambitions, leave our own desires, our own hopes, all that stuff, and um, join in his mission. So Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. I want you to just quickly point at your neighbor and say, good news. I want you to get this into your head. Good news. This is so important. God has called us to be bearers of good news. We have the best news. Amen? I mean, we have the, it can't get any better than the good news that we've got. We have the best news possible. But isn't it funny, sometimes we... Sometimes we forget it. Don't you know what I mean? Sometimes we forget that we have the good news. We walk around like, um, I don't know, like a police officer. And um, we walk around like we're a law enforcer and we enforce the law with our friends and our family. Or um, we enforce the law with those around us and say, that's not according to the law. You shouldn't be doing that kind of thing. And we try and, yeah, do the job of a police officer. Or some people walk around with a judge's gavel and they... um, judge condemnation on people say oh you're going to hell now you did this you did that you know that's not what God has called us to do other people walk around like they've got this special secret 
that, um, that's for them and you know, it's a personal, private little secret that makes them happy and warm and fuzzy inside and they keep it a secret and uh, they live like it's something that's only exclusively for them. But that's not us, is it? We've been called to proclaim the good news. Amen? Amen. The good news of Jesus. The good news that we should not be able to contain. You know, just preparing this message and just asking God to to do it in me first. I know God just blew my heart open with the glory of the gospel, that he would save a wretched sinner like me, someone hopeless, drowning in our sin. Humanity, we are trapped in our cycle of sin. We go over and over and over. We were drowning. We had no hope. All of humanity was heading off the cliff to destruction, and God came in with a plan, and he rescued us. Amen? And man, let's get a bit excited about this good news, that Jesus came down as a man and he lived among us, that God's not a God who's far off. God's not a God who sits in the clouds and throws lightning bolts, but he came down to earth to rescue you. That is good news. That is exciting news that Jesus loved you enough. Like Pastor Barry said, that he's not worried about your inconsistencies and your failures. He's not ticking off your tick list up there. He's seeing the righteousness of Christ when he looks at you. That makes me excited. I want to jump out of my skin sometimes. But sometimes we forget it. Sometimes we live like it's this religious system that we've been welcomed into, but we have the good news of Christ. We have been adopted as sons and daughters and given a purpose and an identity. And that's something to shout about. That's something to scream about. We could just, I could just rant about how good this good news is all day, but I need to keep moving. So what is our mission? We've been called to proclaim the good news. Let's do that. Let's preach it. Let's proclaim it. Let's tell it. Let's share it. But let's live it. Let's act it. Let's walk out that good news that Jesus saved a wretch like me, a sinner drowning in my sin, hopelessly lost, that God rescued me. Oh, what We need to be living that day by day, acting that out, that today is the day of the Lord's salvation. I love that. The last part of the prophecy says, um, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Isn't that awesome? This is the year of the Lord's favour. That's, that's just mind-blowing. You look at every single stereotypical um, rendition of what Christianity is, and it's the exact opposite. This is the year of condemnation. This is the year of uh, damnation. This is the year that everything ends and we all go to hell, and unless you repent, you're going to burn. Um, you know, there's, there's some biblical elements in that, but this is the year that God says of the Lord's favor. He will be coming again, and he will be judging. He'll put on his judge's hat, and he'll come down, and he'll separate the sheets from the goat. But today, today, today is when God wants to save. Today is when God wants to extend mercy. That's exciting. That's exciting. So God has given us this mission. If we can go to the next slide to Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Just to prove that it's our mission, I want to read some verses for you. So Mark 15, verses 15 says this. Jesus said to the disciples, he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Gospel just means good news. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on the sick people and they will get well. Isn't that awesome? Awesome, but sometimes scary, yeah? To be all, in all honesty, like, to preach the good news, I know when it, whenever this kind of sermon comes around for me, I get a little bit uncomfortable. I'm just like, oh, yeah, I guess I, I do. I have been called to this. But we have been called to this, amen? This is our mission. This is your mission. So don't get confused. This is your mission. Our mission as a church, as a collective, as a family, but your mission as an individual, as a member of this church, it's your mission as well. We've been called to share the good news to preach to all creation. Matthew's gospel puts it a little bit differently, and I like the emphasis on it. In Matthew 28, 18, um, it should be on the slide there as well, he says, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples 
of all nations. That is our cause as a church. So on one hand, yeah, we've got to proclaim the gospel, but we are called to make disciples. What's a disciple? It's like a Christian jargon word. A disciple is 100% follower of Christ. Someone that's died to themselves and left their own ways aside. They've uh, repented of their sins. They've turned to God and they said, God, forgive me. And then they live their life pursuing Christ. That is what a disciple is. We have been called to make disciples, to bring in the lost into this place and to then lead them to life and then to raise them up to be followers of Christ who then in turn go out and reach the lost and bring them in and lead them to life and they raise, uh, we raise them up to send them out again. That is what we're called to do. That's awesome. That's what they did in Acts. That's what we're called to do. We've been called not just to preach and ditch, but to make disciples. That's why our church spends so much time doing the DNA groups, reading the Bible, encouraging faith, because we're called to make disciples as a church. So right now, just really quickly, can I just pause and just ask a question? Are you a disciple? Like, I don't care if you call yourself a Christian, that's not what I'm asking, but are you a disciple? Are you really someone that has done that, who's turned away from their way of life and said, you know what, God, my whole life is yours, I surrender. Is like, is that you? Because if that's not, like, can we just be a little bit awkward? And I want to sort this out right now, right here. If you know that you need to become a disciple right now and you need to turn your life to God, you need to get right with Him and not stop pretending to be a Christian, but actually live as a follower of Jesus. You know, we've got some amazing pastors here who'll pray with you right now, even though it's the middle of the sermon. I encourage you to come out or you can come and see us after. But in a minute, soon we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to send you out as a church, as missionaries, as ministers of the gospel. We're going to commission you. But you can't do that unless you're a follower of Christ, okay? So that is so important. You have to be a real disciple. So um, making disciples is what God's called us to do. And it isn't the job of those who run the church. So, you know, Pastor Eugene and Pastor Judy, the other pastors and the elders or the board members or maybe those that are serving the church, it's not their job. It's your job. You are the one who's been called. You are the one who's been called by God, by name. He knows your name. You're not just someone who sits there. Um, You're not just someone that just goes through the motions that's just um, kind of in it. God is calling you right now, and I hope you can hear his voice to say, you have been called with a destiny to preach the good news, to make disciples. 1 Peter 2.9, let's flick that on the screen, says this, but you are the ones chosen by God. You. Just really quickly, point to someone next to you and say, you are chosen. You are chosen. Every single one of you guys has been chosen. I don't care if you're young, if you're old, if you're retired, if you're still in school. I don't care if you're in uni or you just got married. I don't care what your situation is, whether you think you're too much of a stuff up or you're not a good Christian or you don't even know if you are a Christian. It doesn't matter. You have been chosen by God. Chosen for the high calling of priestly work. Isn't that cool? Chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments, to do His work and to speak out for Him, to tell others of the night and day difference that He made for you, from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. 1 Peter 2, 9 in the message version, I like the way it says that. But you've been chosen by God. And isn't that an honour? Can I just, I'm not trying to bring a condemning condemning message that'll leave you all heavy hearted. This is the greatest honor we could ever be given to be chosen by God. See, See that in there. To be God's instruments, to do His work. His work. Isn't that awesome? He wants to use you to change the world. He didn't have to choose us. I mean, in all honesty, if I was God, I wouldn't use me. I know how much I stuff up. I wouldn't use me. I'd be doing it myself or sending some awesome massive big angels to go do the job. But he chose you and me. He chose us to do his work. He could have just put his finger down on the globe and just zapped us all with his glory and we all would have never been the same. But he chose us to be his representatives. He wanted to give us that honour. He chose you. Do you get that? 
He chose you. You are called with a purpose. You have a reason for living in this place. You're not just a result of your parents' accident. You are here with a purpose and a plan. That God puts you here is his, written in his book before the creation of the world that you would be born um, whenever you were born and that you would be sitting in this church right now hearing this message. God planned you to be here. He planned you to be here in 2014. He looked at the timeline and he said, I need them for right here and right now. I need them to be in this community. I need them to be in that family with all its shortcomings, with all its failings, with all the hurt that will be associated with them. I have a plan to put them there for a reason, for a purpose. He planned your life out and he knows your situation and he's put you here. And he, like, I don't want you to get stuck up with your history and your past. Um, because it's not about that. I love that quote that Pastor Barry said about our, our past and our history. God doesn't use that to determine your future. He uses your destiny and you have been destined and called. Amen? Amen. You know, He has not forgotten about you. He has not left you abandoned. You know, as we were, as I was preparing this and praying, God, you know, Use us as a church. Send us, equip us, raise us out, raise us up and then send us out. Let us see the lost get saved. As I was praying that, personally, can I just be honest, I had um, flashbacks of times where I've done awesome things. You know, I've preached on the street. I've used the seed that Stu Miller uses. Um, I've been able to pray for people. I've done some cool things. And, but then I look now, I'm like, oh, but what happened to it all? You know, I stuffed up and I got obsessed with my own life and, you know, maybe that's not who I'm called to be anymore. But, you know, just personally, God spoke to me and he said, you know what? I haven't forgotten about you. Those dreams that you had to see the lost get saved, to lead people to repentance, those dreams that you have, I have them for you still. I'm waiting for you to pick that up again. Amen. Isn't that cool? God has not forgotten about you. The dreams that you had of being someone who has the power to lead people to Christ, praying for the sick and seeing them healed, Um, the friends that you're praying for, the parents or the family that you've been praying for and you've let that dream die. God has said, I'm not forgotten about that. Amen? Amen. So um, we've been chosen. We've been called. Amen? And the last thing that I want to leave with you is that we will be empowered by His Spirit. So His Spirit will empower us. So not only are you called, you're equipped and empowered. Let's look at Jesus' first words when He reads this verse. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Let's stop there. That's awesome. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's just crazy. God came down from heaven to become a man. And yet, when He got baptised, The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit filled him. Isn't that crazy? That he relied on the Holy Spirit. He had to go and pray. He had to go and seek God. He had to rely on the Spirit's power to do his day-by-day life. He's leading us. He's leaving us an example. He's saying, you know, if I'm God and I need to pray, (laughs) then you definitely need to pray. You're humans. So his Spirit was on Jesus through... um, the thought of, for me, walking up to my friends and family that aren't saved and saying, you know, God's got good news for you. You can be saved. You can be, have your destiny secured in heaven. God wants to um, redeem you. He wants to clean all your sins. He wants to give you life more abundantly now. Um, the idea for me of preaching that message to some of my friends and family that aren't saved or my work colleagues, it freaks me out. Can I just be honest? It freaks me out. And I'm sure it freaks you out too. But maybe you too. But Jesus was empowered and emboldened by the Holy Spirit. So he depended on the Spirit for everything. And he has told us not to do anything until we receive the Spirit. Because he will enable you to be his witness by the Spirit. If you've been filled with the Spirit or if you haven't, then seek it. But his Spirit will empower you and it will give you the boldness that we need. Amen. Because that's what we need. We need that boldness, that courageousness to say, you know what, I have a message and you need to hear it. You need to hear it because the reality is that our friends need to hear it. We are the ones that God has placed in this world to be the light of the world. If we don't shine, no one else will. We are called with that message, but we need the boldness from His Spirit 
So if you're sitting there and you're shaking in your boots and you're like, oh no, I'm going to have to do it, pray for boldness. Pray for the Spirit and He will give it to you. He will give it to you more abundantly. He will give you so much courageousness and boldness that you will just be jumping out of your seat to share the gospel. And I know it's freaky. It's kind of like um, I heard an analogy from Mike Pilavachi. He said, when you step out in faith into the supernatural realm of God, it's kind of like being on a massive big high diving board, um, like an Olympic-sized diving board. And you stand on the diving board and you look out towards the pool and the pool down below is empty. There's no water in the pool. And God's telling you, Jump off, jump into my pool, my, my ocean. Um, and you're like, there's no water in there, God. And God says, trust me, just jump and I'll fill it with water. And it's kind of like Mike says, Mike Pilavachi says, you know, I, I stand and I say, how about you fill it with water first and then I'll jump. Um, and God's saying, no, I want you to jump in faith, trusting me 100% that I'm going to fill it with water. Kind of freaky, but that's what God's calling us to do to step out in faith into the realm of the unknown. You have no idea how your work colleague will respond when you say, hey, do you know Jesus loves you? You have no idea what will happen, but it's like stepping off that platform. You gotta believe God. And it might blow up in your face. They might hate you. They might try and kill you. They might fire you of your job. Um, It doesn't matter. (laughs) Worst things have happened, amen? Amen? I was reading some stories this week um, of a Muslim girl who found life, found Christ, and she was so excited. And she was going to the church, led there by the pastor's wife. And um, anyway, the, uh, in Iran, Tehran, the Revolutionary Guard found the pastor and the pastor's wife, and they locked them up in jail, and they locked her up in jail. After three years, they released her, um, and her own brother tracks her down and stabs her to death to redeem the... Um, to redeem the honour of their family as Muslims because she converted to be a Muslim. But, you know, she, she paid the ultimate price to share the gospel, to live a life following God. You know, for us, man, that's nothing, getting laughed at, getting... I mean, it is for us. We get scared, but in reality, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they turn around and shoot us with the gun in the head. We've got glory, man. God is good enough in us. God will fill that pool. You jump out and God will do something. It might not be what you want. They might not bow on their knees straight away and surrender to God, but you're planting a seed. You're being obedient to God and God will give you the strength that you need. Luke 10, 18. I love this verse. This is after Jesus sent some of his disciples um, out and they came back and they're all like, oh, it was awesome. God, it really worked. You know, we prayed for people and they got healed. We preached the gospel and they got saved. And Jesus says to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. God said, I've given you authority. You can overcome all the power of the enemy. I have equipped you with all that you need. I've chosen you, I've called you, and I've commissioned you, and now I'm giving you the power. Go and do it. Go and change the world. My prayer is that this message for us would be a wake-up call to take on that mission, to take on that cause, to go into the world and to be the ones to change it. Amen? We have been called. It's, it's through us. God's going to do it through us. So as a church, what we're going to do is something a little bit different in a minute, but we're going to do that. We're going to send each other out. We're going to pray and believe that God's going to fill us with power and boldness. So as a church, I want us to commission every single one of us to no longer be a congregation member, okay? If you, uh, I don't want to be too offensive, but if you are just... Uh, completely content to just sit as a congregation member every single Sunday and just come along and then go home and have nothing changed and have nothing motivated for you or um, not be moved by God in any way to act, then I believe God needs to change something in your heart. I believe that you need to encounter Him for real and let Him um, change you in an amazing way. But I believe that we are going to be commissioned to no longer be a congregation member. That's not what God's called you to be. To no longer be um, a church attendee, to no longer be a part of the audience, but you are being commissioned right now by God to be the bearers of good news, to be witnesses of His goodness in your life, to be His representatives 
on earth, to be His instrument, to be used by God, to be like a funnel where God can pour out His love and mercy and grace and favour into you and you in then in turn will touch the world and through the touch of your hand, God will flow like lightning through you and touch people, amen? God has called you to bring healing, to bring hope, to bring life. And you don't have to have a Bible college degree. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to even be a good Christian. You just have to be obedient and love God and ask Him to use you. Ask Him to use you and um, He will. He will. So what we're going to do is something a little bit crazy. I don't think we've ever done this before in church, but we are going to commission, literally pray, lay hands on every single one here and commission them to be servants and missionaries. Amen? Because this church is not meant to be a little holy club. We're not meant to be a little nice, happy, clappy Christian club. This should be like an ammunition dump. You know what I mean? We come back off the battlefield tired and hungry and thirsty. We come in, we fill up, we load up our grenades and we refill our guns with the ammunition. We check everything out and then we get back out there on the battlefield. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Then when Sunday comes, it's like, thank God, Sunday's here. Let's quickly load up and get back out onto the field. Amen. We are called to be that. So what we're going to do is I want everyone to break up right now into groups of three or four, no more. And you're going to actually pray for each other in this group and pray that God will fill you with boldness and the Spirit and with power. So let's go for it. Let's go. God, right now I just pray that you would commission us, that you would send us, that you would fill us with your Spirit, God. We ask in Jesus' name, in boldness, that you would use each and every single one of us here for your glory, for your purpose, to share your good news, to tell the world that today is the day of salvation, that you have bought us and redeemed us. Amen. Farah, now what we're going to do is I want you to pray again and start calling out the names of your unsaved friends and family, your work colleagues, your um, neighbours, and let's call them out by name and in faith agree that this year God is going to save them. God is going to use this year as the year of salvation in their life. So quickly, I'll give you five minutes to pray for some of those lives, pray for some of those names, um, and then the, church, the worship band will lead us. So let's keep praying for two more minutes for those names. All right, but Acts 4.29 says this, the apostles said, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. That's our prayer. Enable us to speak with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God boldly. Amen. We are going to shake this nation. We're going to shake Kapalaba with the power of God. Far out. I'm excited. I'm so excited. Let me just quickly read again one more thing, and then we're going to let the worship team wrap us up and pray. So Luke 4, when Jesus stood up, He read that prophecy. I want to change it around a little bit, because God has called and commissioned you to do the work of Jesus now. So the Spirit of the Lord is on you. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is on you, because He has anointed each one of you to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent you to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. He has sent you to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Amen. Can we give God a round of applause and just uh, praise God and let's go for it.